Good morning. I'd like to uh, call the uh, session of the Public Service Commission to order. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, Secretary Burgess, is there any changes to the agenda? Good morning. There is one addition to the agenda today. Case 13-W-0246, the interlocutory appeal filed by the Town of Ramapo in the United Water New York case, long-term water supply surcharge case, has been added to the agenda and it's numbered 462. Okay. Thank you. Um, typically, we, we deal with the uh, regular items and then move on to the consent agenda. I'd like today be just to reverse the order and move uh, into the consent agenda. Um, with respect to that, I just want to note that we do have one item, and it's item number 361, which is the uh, petition of CPV Valley, and um, it's to get a C, a CPN, is that correct, Council? CPCN, and it's under Section 68. Uh, of the public service law. I wanted to be really clear about this because I know that there are a number of comments that we received on this request um, uh, concerning environmental concerns and land use concerns. And, I, and there's a, I want to make sure there's no confusion that Section 68, which is what we're reviewing the CPCN under, is not a citing statute and rather the decision as to whether or not to cite the power plant actually resides with the planning board of the town of Waywanda, who and that town has already given its approval. Rather, our task under 68 is very limited, and it's only to consider whether CPV Valley LLCs should be allowed to act in the wholesale electric market as a New York and electric corporation. What we're really considering is whether the charter of the corporation is adequate and whether the, the company has received the required consents of the proper municipal authorities. The question is really not whether or not a plant is needed. It's, it's really only whether another electric corporation is needed. And because we're working in a de deregulated market, and, and therefore, in this case, it's not ratepayers who will be paying this, but it's actually the company shareholders at risk. It's a very limited purview, and, and our typical process is to say so long as they required achieve the, the required permits that we would allow for another electric corporation because we do favor competition in the markets because additional competition is in the best interest of consumers. So to the extent, therefore, that um, – we have comments regarding environmental concerns, land use concerns. It's really outside the purview of this particular proceeding. I wanted to make sure that that was clear to the public and why, and, and that our focus is extraordinarily limited in this situation. Um, so that, that's one. We have another matter, and this is the Horseheads matter. I think it's 169. So, and just on that, um, in that particular case, there's a request on the part of the par of the utilities who we've asked to do a, a very comprehensive risk analysis concerning uh, pi gas pipes and our concerns about the safety of these pipes is that uh, we recognize that the risk analysis that we've asked the companies to I recognize that the risk analysis we've asked the companies to do uh, is, is is really extensive and we want to make sure it's done right so the fact that they've asked for additional six months well, while we want this done as our additional year, we want this done as quickly as possible. And I, we're, and I think the recommendation, which I support, is to give the companies another six months. At the same time, however, that proceeding is we're also looking at gas safety issues relative to making certain that there's education of the public. And I want to make sure that you know we're we're proceeding with that aspect of our inquiry with all due diligence, and also. Um, to make it clear to the parties and staff is, is our expectation is that the scope of that inquiry in terms of what can we do to make certain that the public is aware of gas safety issues and reports them is not should not be considered constrained by any limitation that this is just about education or notifying people of, the, of odor. But other issues such as the availability of technology that would improve safety and even additional information such as location, if it's appropriate, 
I would expect that the that the utilities and the staff and others involved in this proceeding make sure they take an expanded review and that we come out of that inquiry with as good as a process as we can, with as good a decision as we can as to what needs to be done to ensure that the public is informed and can inform us if they smell gas or if there's other technology available that we're looking for ways to start to implement that. So, uh, Kevin, I see you in the back, uh, and I just want to be clear that there's no uh, – there's, there's no handcuffs on this. We want a full inquiry, and we want to make sure all the issues are explored. At least I do, and I, and I assume you understood that. I, I do understand, and I am meeting with NGA, uh, Northeast Gas Association, this afternoon, and I'll make sure that we all understand it. Okay. I, I have no other further comments on that or either any other item, but I just wanted to note that. I just want to echo and also thank you for uh, your leadership on um, the gas safety issue and also um, the hard work uh, that staff has been doing. And uh, I know that they really appreciate um, just how much you have uh, been involved uh, on this issue. So thank you very much. Not necessary. I think the hard work is staff, but thank you. Um, so with that, I have no further comments. Um, any other comments on the consent agenda of fighting commissioners? Okay. Do any of the commissioners wish to recuse or abstain from the consent agenda? No. Hearing none, all those in favor of the recommendations on the consent agenda, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Um, opposed? Hearing no opposition, the recommendations are adopted. So now we'll move on to the regular agenda. And thank you for allowing me to take this out of order. The first item for discussion is item 101, which is the National Fuel Gas Distribution Corporation rate proceeding. And I believe uh, Administrative uh, Law Judges Presterman and Casuto will be presenting this. Okay. Who's beginning? I'll, okay. I'll be speaking first. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Chair Zebelman, Commissioners. Um, the draft order you have before you in this case would uh, bring to a conclusion the examination of the rates of National Fuel Gas Distribution Corporation that was uh, begun by order of the Commission back in April of 2013 after a staff analysis of um, National Fuel's recent earnings. Um, it would do so by approving the terms of a joint proposal that was submitted to the Commission, was signed and supported by the company, by department staff, by multiple interveners, the utility intervention unit of the Department of State, and People United for Sustainable Housing Push Buffalo. Uh, under the terms of the joint proposal, uh, the rates of national fuel would be frozen at their current levels. Uh, those rates have been in effect uh, since uh, January 1st, 2008, they would be frozen through September 30th, 2015, meaning by the end of this rate plan, um, the ratepayers in National Fuel Service territory would have enjoyed a rather remarkable nearly eight years of stable rates, uh, which means, of course, that in real terms, the cost of gas service in National Fuel Service territory has been and will continue to be steadily declining. Uh, combined with uh, lower national uh, natural gas commodity prices, this means that uh, natural gas heating in western New York uh, has actually gotten substantially more affordable over the last few years. Uh, other important terms of the, um, of the joint proposal uh, include a provision for $5.5 million in direct refunds to uh, customers, a one-time credit that would be issued to customers, uh, upon approval of the order. Uh, there's also a significant increase in funding for pro programs aimed at providing assistance uh, to low-income customers, including $1.75 million uh, in additional funding for a home weatherization program uh, administered by NYSERDA, uh, $250,000 for a furnace replacement program, and the creation of a $12.50 monthly bill credit for all 80,000 of National Fuels Home Energy Assistance Program uh, benefit recipients uh, that would be provided 
uh, during the winter heating months. Um, in addition, the the uh, the agreement would provide for increased rate allowances for site investigation and remediation and for pension and other post-employment benefits expenses that would will go towards the reduction of accumulated deferrals that might otherwise have required rate increases uh, in the future. They will substantially reduce those deferrals. Um, in addition, the provisions of the agreement uh, tighten the safety standards uh, applicable to national fuel and increase the potential negative uh, negative earnings adjustments um, applicable to failure to meet those standards and it also provides 8.2 million dollars in additional funding for important safety related uh, replacement of leak prone pipe uh, and finally the it would provide one million dollars in stable annual funding for the area development program which provides for economic development projects gas related economic development projects within national fuel service territory um, this agreement was uh, some five months in the making five months of negotiations among these parties and the amount of time is not at all surprising because they had a very difficult task not only were they in effect doing a complete rate case for future rates uh, but as you recall, in the in the order initiating this proceeding, the commission told the parties to take into account the possible applicability of Public Service Law 66, uh, Section 6620, which uh, provides for the possibility of recovery of over earnings from past periods. Uh, and also, in June of last year, the commission made um, National Fuels' current rates temporary, subject to refund. Um, so the parties not only had to do a rate case, but they had to consider what, uh, how to treat past and continuing over earnings. Um, and they did so quite well, I believe. They addressed the, the past over earnings issues and the temporary rates issues by agreeing upon a $7.5 million credit that would be, uh, created upon approval of the of this uh, agreement for the benefit of ratepayers and would be used to uh, to fund the benefits I described before the 5.5 million dollars in refunds and the programs for low-income customers uh, as to the future rates current uh, that would apply they began with the premise that the that rates would be frozen as I mentioned uh, they then developed uh, based on an analysis a, a rate case type analysis performed by staff they developed a revenue requirement uh, for national fuel then comparing the revenue requirement calculated or an, an agreed upon to the revenues that would be generated by the frozen rates uh, they found that national fuel would continue to have some substantial excess earnings. They then agreed to apply those excess earnings uh, to repurpose them for ratepayers, for the benefit of ratepayers. Um, they calculated, oh, by the, I, I should have mentioned, they calculated the revenue requirement based on a 9.1% ROE and a 48% um, equity ratio, both of which are consistent with uh, what the Commission has approved in other recent cases. Um, and as I said, the, the excess earnings uh, revealed by this analysis were then applied to increase the rate allowances for, as I mentioned, uh, pensions and other post-employment benefits and SIR expenses in order to decrease deferrals. And after that, there was still $1 million in, in calculated excess earnings which uh, National Fuel agreed to credit immediately upon approval of the agreement to ratepayers as, as an offset against deferrals for which ratepayers would otherwise be responsible. So uh, the potential for future excess earnings was also addressed by the parties 
they established an uh, earnings sharing mechanism, uh, very much consistent with others that have been adopted in uh, multi-year rate plans. The earnings sharing agreement would has actually has a very small dead band during which there will be no sharing uh, above the 9.1 percent ROE that would be authorized. Uh, there would be a dead band of 40 basis points. At 9.5 percent, 50-50 sharing with customers would begin. At 10.5 percent, the sharing would go to 80 percent customers, 20 percent company. The customer share of uh, the excess earnings would be applied to further reduce the deferrals. So there are substantial provisions here to keep deferrals under control. Some other no notable features of the agreement include um, a requirement that National Fuel develop a pilot gas expansion program to extend service to customers uh, no longer getting it. This is a very important provision for low-income customers because many of them live in older housing stock uh, and have oil or propane or other uh, relatively high-cost fuels now in comparison with what have become quite affordable costs for uh, natural gas. Um, the agreement also calls for a collaborative uh, to consider the expansion of the pu Public Assistance Cooperative Energy Program in, in National Fuel Service Territory, which uh, is a program that aggregates low-income customers, HEAP recipients, um, to uh, allow them to allow gas to be purchased by bid from a, an outside supplier, according to um, UIU, this has consistently provided 5% um, in savings for participants, uh, and the idea here is to expand it. Right now it's only available to public systems customers. Uh, the idea is to expand it possibly to heap customers as well in the service territory. Um, again, as I mentioned, the uh, gas safety re standards are s significantly tightened. And the service quality performance mechanism that has been in place uh, is continued. Um, as you know, the parties to this agreement uh, represent the full spectrum of uh, national fuel customers, uh, residential, commercial, industrial, low income. Um, their positions in our cases are often, if not always, uh, adverse and they were so, so at the beginning of this case as well. Um, the fact uh, that they have now come together and produced um, what I consider and I believe the rest of advisory staff agrees with me is a very fair, equitable and even innovative agreement um, uh, makes it, I believe, well worth, worthy of your approval. And that ends my comments. If you have any questions. <laughs> you never know. situation there we go um, and then um, you know so so applaud the staff both and the Commission for um, its initiate the initiation but clearly you know from the standpoint of the fact that this involves a very comprehensive settlement of both of staff and the company the uh, push organization the multiple interveners and UIU it, it really shows that that I'm, I'm the effects of what happens when parties get together. I'm sure there was a lot of give and take and moments when um, everyone thought it would collapse, but it appears that uh, the willingness of folks to innovate, to be creative, to compromise has resulted in a product that, that is fabulous for customers. I think the ability to have fixed rates for an extended period, the credits, the additional uh, work on low income, which I think is very important, particularly in, in this area of the state, and then uh, ultimately the also looking at the safety improvements and economic development comprehensively 
do what we would like it to do is maintain gas affordability, allow for gas expansion, and at the same time maintain a significant focus on, on gas safety. Uh, all, all very critical elements, I think, of uh, what we want to do with uh, gas industry in New York. So I applaud the parties. I'm appreciative of the fact that settlements are never easy. They're sometimes much harder than litigation. And uh, also, again, thanks to staff for their great work for keep it continuing to guide folks along. So I also uh, would note my intention to approve this. Um, any further questions, comments? Commissioner Sir. In my view, this is a better deal for Western New York than we would have achieved in a fully litigated rate case. It has new programs, benefits for consumers, and sharing mechanisms that are not typically results in a case where everything is contested. I support the proposal and I echo the chair's commendation to staff the parties and the administrative law judges for achieving this result. I didn't note them, but I agree. <laughs> Commissioner Berman. It's clear that the company cares about their community, so kudos. Thank you. Commissioner. Yeah, I just, again, I play historian over in the corner I know, here. There you are, the old but, man in the corner. You know, <laughs> exactly. This was a company that, through their own initiatives, managed to reduce some of their internal costs and got themselves in a position of some excess earnings. And this was never designed to, in any way, punish a company for good performance and in fact they got to take advantage of that good performance for a number of years and this proceeding kind of puts that all behind us they did they were the last company I believe Doris help me if I'm wrong with a revenue sharing risk mechanism that we it wasn't in their last case which meant that all excess earnings was maintained by the company um, now I think we have a wonderful balance in place I am thrilled that they managed with push to come together and figure out a way to uh, help the low-income communities to their satisfaction. Um, never enough for, you know, things like that, but to bring them on board I think is a major, a major victory. So I just want to thank the company, the staff, push, um, and all of the uh, people that were involved in getting us to this place because this provides some stability for yet a few more years. It in includes a sharing mechanism so if we get into a different circumstance the parameters are already laid out and so thanks to everyone for getting us to this place and I think it's a victory for everyone. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Akbar. I'll just chime in. I think that also I agree with my fellow commissioners. Uh, usually the parties that we're talking about today uh, most of the time we're very adversarial toward each other and it just goes to show when you focus in on doing the right thing, how people can come together and get a good quality product uh, for the benefit of everyone. I, I really uh, address uh, the part of the low income programs. I think they're, it took a lot of leadership to get this done and I think that these programs will stand the course and help a lot of people in an area of our state that um, sometimes struggles a bit. Uh, this is really good for all consumers, low-income consumers, uh, residential consumers, and commercial and industrial consumers. Uh, so, uh, Dave, as the chair said, you were quite eloquent today. You must be on your medication. <laughs> and I know you've been away for so long. I always look forward to when you give a presentation because you always do an excellent job. So uh, congratulations to all the parties involved and many thanks uh, to the staff for sticking in there and making sure that this was really done right. Something to be proud of. Thank you. Well, then uh, let's take a vote on this item. And um, all those in favor of the recommendation to approve the terms of the joint proposal establishing the two-year rate plan for National Fuel Gas Distribution Corporation, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Here be, there being no opposition, the recommendation is approved. And again, thank you very much for everyone who contributed to this result. Our second item for discussion is item 201A and 201B. This is a uh, proceeding to consider a clean energy fund, and Colleen Gerwitz, who's the Director of Office of Energy Efficiency and the Environment, will be presenting this, correct, Colleen? 
Okay, good. Please proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Zimbelman and Commissioner. Today, you have two cleaner. Oops. Now, can you hear me? Now? Can you hear me? Is the mic working now? All right. So anyways, there are two clean energy fund related items before you today. One's a resolution authorizing the preparation of a generic environmental impact statement to assess the potential environmental impacts associated with the development of a clean energy fund. The second is a draft order commencing a proceeding to consider the development of a clean energy fund. The draft clean energy fund order that is before you builds off from the December 2013 EAPS order and the recent April 25th reforming energy vision order that together began the process of transitioning the state's clean energy efforts to a more modern regulatory framework. The draft order recognizes that the role of commission authorized clean energy programs will undergo significant changes in support of more market driven solutions such as the New York Sun and Green Bank initiatives and REV. The intent of a clean energy fund of the Clean Energy Fund is to ensure continuity of the state's clean energy programs during this transition and to provide the flexibility that will be needed to adjust allocations of funds among clean energy initiatives in response to evolving market conditions. The draft order proposes that this flexibility be bounded by a discipline of a transparent upper limit on ratepayer contributions, that is an annual funding cap as well as directional goals and objects, objectives applicable to the fund. Using ratepayer funds to support the growth of robust markets in combination with the regulatory reforms being considered in the REV proceeding will lead to a more efficient use of ratepayer funds and a decreased need for ratepayer surcharges to support these programs. So the order proposes not only a cap, but a cap that decreases over time. The draft order recognizes that under REV, the utilities will develop plans as part of their system planning and operation function to increasingly integrate distributed energy resources into their systems. The utilities' current surcharge funded EAPS programs will evolve to become a component of these utility plans. As part of these plans, future utility efficiency efforts will be treated like any other part of the utility's revenue requirement rather than being funded through a dedicated surcharge. NYSERDA's efforts will also need to evolve and should focus on market and transformative strategies that are designed to provide temporary intervention and support to overcome specific barriers and produce self-sustaining results. NYSERDA's efforts should also ensure continued support for low-income customers who are less able to obtain market-based services. In this context, the draft order directs NYSERDA, in consultation with staff, to develop a comprehensive clean energy fund proposal by August 13th of 2014 for commission consideration and stakeholder comment. The draft order requires the proposal to recommend annual ratepayer collection levels that would serve as fixed annual caps for each year between 2016 and 2020. The recommended collection levels are to be below the total RPS, EAPS, and SBC 2015 collection levels and should decline in reflection of the full capitalization of the Green Bank and the expected transition of the utility EAPS programs to, the, to their REV plans. The proposal should identify directional goals and objectives for the Clean Energy Fund that align with, align with and support state energy plan policies and should address the issue of fuel neutrality as appropriate. The proposal should also address the possibility of transition, transitioning to a bill-as-you-go model where collections supporting NYSERDA programs are retained in utility accounts and transferred to NYSERDA as needed in accordance with expenditures. The draft order also directs NYSERDA in consultation with staff to develop and submit a plan and schedule within 30 days for obtaining broad stakeholder input during the development of this Clean Energy Fund proposal. The draft order also redirects and clarifies some items from the December 2013 EAPS order. As the scope of the REV proceeding has come into sharper focus, it is clear that some of the activities that were assigned to the E-squared working group in the December order are more appropriately considered in the context of this proceeding and the REV proceeding. So the draft order provides clarification regarding the appropriate home for the various activities and eliminates the requirement for a June 1 action plan associated with those activities. Similarly, the order, draft order clarifies that the funds were authorized that were authorized to support these activities 
may continue to be used to support these activities and others that staff deems appropriate to align the clean energy programs with the REV regulatory framework, including the secret compliance for both the Clean Energy Fund and the REV proceeding. That concludes my presentation. I, Tony Belsito, and Deb Bell are available to respond to any questions. Great. Uh, let me begin and see if there are any questions for uh, the staff. Commissioner Berman. Thank you. Um, I have a number of questions, um, and I'm not sure if you're going to have all the answers to them. So if you don't, it's okay if you say you don't know the answers or have them at this moment. Um, I guess the first threshold, threshold question is we're commencing, we're being asked to commence a proceeding today. Is there anything else other than commencing a proceeding that we're being asked to do today, substantively, legally? I'm, I'm going to answer that question, Commissioner. One of um, two things you're asked to do today, in addition to commencement of the proceeding, and that is a clarification as to the requirements to file the action plan on June 1, as my colleague indicated. The second is clarification of a previous order that authorized certain funds for NYSERDA to utilize in conducting the environmental assessments that are necessary in relation to both REV and to the Clean Energy Fund. So I want to be clear on that. Okay. And the clarification as to the filing the action plan is really clarifying that we're saying we're no longer going to require the action plan. Is that correct? So it's clarifying that we're saying we're no longer requiring the action plan to be filed. We're not requiring the action plan to be filed on June 1 because, as Colleen indicated, the activities contemplated in the working group, which would then produce that plan, are being subsumed into the, both the clean energy proceeding, which you would commence today by your vote, as well as the REV proceeding, which was commenced at the April session. Okay, so the clarification is really changing the requirement. Okay. And the clarification to that also ties into the authorization or the direction of the $5 million that we had tied to the E2 working group. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. So what's the $5 million now tied to? The $5 million, which I think is the ratepayer funds? Right. Am I correct? I just want to make that. sure because I'm very, just so you know, my sort of focus, and I know all of the commissioners are focused on the you know, our obligation to um, the responsibility we have for ratepayer funds. So I just want to be clear when we are um, authorizing anything to do with ratepayer funds that I understand what we're doing with ratepayer funds. So I just am just making sure that I understand that. Dan, it was an up to amount first mm -hmm. of all, to be available Thank to support you. various activities to advance these programs, mm -hmm. okay? Um, currently, like I said, it'll be used to support the, the seeker assessment right. for both of these initiatives. So that's one def definitive task. The other one that we're planning on doing, you know, that's in the works right now is continuing to work on a tech technical resource manual that we've got in place that will continue to work on developments of that that we believe will continue to have value for the current programs as well as future programs. And as we identify other potential tasks, like I could give you other examples, you know, of other things that may become clear that will continue to provide value into the future as well as now the staff will bring those recommendations, you know, and we you know, if there needs to be a mechanism to do bring that to you for approval, we can do that. But the point is, is that we needed to have the flexibility to be able to get to providing these additional resources to make these tasks happen, some of these activities. Okay, th th thank you. So now when we're looking at this, we're looking at now authorizing NYSERDA to work with staff to come back in August 2014 to submit a proposal for a comprehensive clean energy fund. Is that correct? Correct. So this proposal for this comprehensive clean energy fund will be going forward for 2016 through 2020? The proposal, that's when it would, it's the design of the programs and the funding levels to support the programs for that period of time, yes. Okay. So the 
and let me make sure I understand this then. So that comprehensive clean energy fund would be comprehensive of what? Would that be RPS? The, the point is, yes, it would be the proposal is to consider the full suite of clean energy programs. Okay, and with that full suite, and let me just say it, it would be RPS with that? RPS, e e EAPS, EAPS, and SBC Technology and Market Development. And Green Bank? And Green Bank and New York Sun. And Reggie? Reggie's not under this. Okay, but would they also be, would Reggie be separate? So it would be comprehensive but not include Reggie, but Reggie could also be utilized by NYSERDA? Okay. So Green Bank, we authorized $700 million. Right. So technically, under this comprehensive clean energy fund, by authorizing it, then they could then utilize part of that clean energy fund and they wouldn't have to come back to us for the remainder of the billion dollars that had been talked about? The, the proposal, the Clean Energy Fund proposal, will consider all of those, that full suite of activities, including Green Bank, and the funding that they need in each of those years to support that suite of activities. So the idea would be that they would lay that out, what, that, okay. what, what the planned allocation would be, They'd still have to come in with a petition to seek that additional approval for that extension of that program and approval of that funding for that particular purpose. So this sets up the broad parameters, and then they'll be under for each of each of the activities. You'd have to approve it again. So, I want to just I, make a oh, go ahead. clarification go ahead. here. The Green Bank is on the separate proceeding track, and it has a distinction in activity. It's it's a financing vehicle. So I just I just want to be clear as the Clean Energy Fund is a, the proceeding initiates an examination as to how you could combine EAPS, RPS, and SBC into one pot of funding. And the appropriate levels of that funding through 2016 to 2020, reflective of the activities that are going on in the marketplace driven by Green Bank and those driven through the REV proceeding to rate cases and, and other market development. So I don't want to muddy the waters here because Green Bank has its proceeding and it has a distinguished um, uh, responsibility and that more work may be necessary on Green Bank. But Clean Energy Fund is complementary and reflective of the work going on in the Green Bank. I but totally agree with you about not muddying the waters. That's why I'm being very careful both legally and also as regulators because if we're talking about a comprehensive clean energy fund and we're talking about the fact that we're going to take all of the comprehensive funds and put it into a clean energy fund, I want to be careful with the ratepayer funds and make sure, especially because we're giving ratepayer funds to NYSERDA, which is the appropriate entity, and when and, and when we're looking at that, I want to make sure that when we do that, that I understand what pots of, of funding that we're giving them. So if the Clean Energy Fund is truly comprehensive, or if we're limiting it and saying it doesn't include the Green Bank, because the Green Bank is right now, what with the $700 million, was part of RPS, part of EAPS, part of SBC, unencumbered funds, and part of REGI. So we really need to make sure that we carefully articulate what the ratepayer funds are and where they're coming from. If, so I just want to make clear when I'm looking at this and when NYSERDA is coming back with their proposal that it's very, very clear because it is very confusing. And it needs to be clear because if I don't understand it, I'm very concerned because then the ratepayers who are the ones who have to pay it and it's there, it's we're collecting from the ratepayers, we have to be careful. So that's why I'm trying to understand what the collections are and what the funding sources are and why we're collecting it into one comprehensive fund and it truly isn't fully comprehensive because we're also now I'm hearing from um, our legal counsel that it's not going to contain the collections that may be coming in the future for the further collections that will be needed for the Green Bank. I, I don't think that's correct. The the, the, the the concept here, as I understand it, and this is, um, and perhaps we should we should clarify this, is that uh, previously we we have uh, we had separate funds, EAPS, RPS, 
um, as well as uh, the SBC funding. Rather than having these segregated funds, which made it very complicated to administer, the idea is to move from a separate funds to an, in a one fund, which we're nominating the Clean Energy Fund, which will be budget-bound and will be predicated on the fact that over the next duration, there are going to be elements that we need to continue to uh, collect ratepayer charges to fund clean energy projects to allow for this transition away from ratepayer funded to market funded energy efficiency clean energy projects but we recognize we're in transition so there's two pieces of it that I under that that I believe are really critical one is just to make sure that we understand that it's this is a, a commencement of the transition and is complementary and consistent with what we're saying in all of these dockets, in REV docket, in the, in the um, uh, Green Bank docket, and even in EAPS, is that we realize that we're moving point to, from a point where energy efficiency, clean energy was considered part of the periphery to part of the core of operating the system. And what we expect to see, particularly out of REV, is an increased movement to finding commercial market-based solutions that are consistent with a rate-making regime that recognizes the value of these investments to help maintain a reliable, resilient, affordable, and clean system. So we're moving it to the center. At the same time, there's a period of time we're going to need a transition, where there's a period of time that we're going to need to con continue to collect from cons rate payers. And particularly what we want to do is while we're having the utilities refocus their attention, we think about where NYSERDA now is in thinking about administering these ratepayer funds, where best to focus and be much more efficient in terms of where these funds are placed to, one, accelerate markets, to, particularly for things like Green Bank, to look at market transformational activities, and to continue to fund programs where the markets may not be, such as low-income or rural areas where you might not see a commercial market develop as quickly and potentially look at new technologies that, again, could use some help that could be highly valuable. Well, I don't want to what, – what I believe the Clean Energy Fund does is it sets us on a path of saying, number one, this is how much is available for funding, and we truly expect the budget to come in to be less – than what we're, we have baked into the 2015 collections. So it'll be a reduction below that and continue to reduce over the five years, reflecting the fact that we expect to see increased expenditures by market-based solutions. So the commitment to the state as a whole to energy efficiency will continue to grow, but it will grow through market innovations, not by continuing increasing collections of ratepayers, and we should if we're, and I believe we will be successful, be able to see a reduction in these ratepayer collections as the market picks up. And so this is a really, think about this as a bridge to where we want to be, where we have sustainable market-based solutions, although I, you know, with a possibility over time, and I think this will continue, that we'll continue to identify areas where government can leverage ratepayer funding most effectively to ensure that these markets continue to evolve to a point, I hope, that in our future that this becomes part and parcel with electric service and we don't require ratepayer funding anymore. So it is a transition. It is a change in moving to a budget-bounded approach as opposed to segmenting dollars for specific programs. And I think it allows us the flexibility and the focus we need of thinking about the complementary activities of government funding, versus market evolution with a recognition that our expectation is that we're going to see market animation and actually then the market supplanting and improving what we could do from ratepayer funding itself. That, that to me, is sort of the overarching objective. And, I, you know, so that's why I think it's difficult. It sounds complex. But in the end, I think if we allow our DICERTA and staff to, con to develop this type of process, we'll find that it's very complementary to what we're trying to do elsewhere with REV, New York Sun, as well as with um, the Green Bank. And I think, so, so I appreciate the need that we need to be very specific and clear because it can get confusing no, on I, what I we're doing. I don't think, I think if you'll listen to the rest of my questions, I think we're on the same page, no, I, yes. which I think really is that we are looking at exactly 
why I have concerns with commencing this proceeding without a thorough review. So when I look at all of this, all of what you're speaking to goes to the Green Bank and the REV proceeding and also what we've been talking about, which is the RPS and the EAPS review, the comprehensive review. Um, and so when we speak to, and this is, you know, from, from my perspective is, folks have been asking for um, when is the next RPS solicitation, um, when is, you know, the, the EAPS review, the comprehensive review, and, and I know that staff has been diligently working on this. So what I've been sort of looking at and trying to figure out is if we are going to have a transition um, away from a um, ratepayer subsidy-based um, focus, and we are truly going to get to um, a market-based um, approach, um, how are we going to do that if we keep kicking the can down the road without fully doing the comprehensive review? I'm not hearing that the RPS main tier system is broken. Um, what I'd like to look at is understanding what has what have the collections been, um, what are the collections in RPS? Can you can you give me a ballpark on what are the current collections um, in RPS? That's not my head. I can bring the numbers with me. What again. are the current collections in EAPS? We're work. Okay. Um, know what the totals what, what are. What have I'm been the the what has been expended so far? We have that information. I'm gathering it for you as you okay. know. Okay. Um, now I I know that you said that right now that the proposal that's going to be asked for from NYSERDA um, is going to be, and let me just make sure when I look at the order, excuse me, while I get it. The proposal should recommend annual ratepayer collection levels for each year of the 2016-2020 program cycle and beyond. The proposed annual collection level should ideally be below the authorized 2015 total annual collection levels. So ideally be. So could, in fact, we be looking at um, collect, proposed annual collection levels at higher than the authorized 2015 total annual collection levels currently? I think what, let me, um, let me just jump in here. What I'd like to see out of this and, and what I've, and what I'm, why I believe that this is the right way to go is, is the expectation is that the budget bounded approach, the amount of dollars that we're going to be collecting from ratepayers should be less than what we've, co we authorized for 2015 because we are starting this transition away from ratepayer funding. The budget-bounded approach that I expect to see is a rational budget that will tell the Commission, with this amount of collection of dollars, these are the things that we could believe that we can achieve in terms of the various programs, the main tier RPS, the uh, New York Sun, the Green Bank, and EAPS. And so it will be a full record, the type of information that you're looking for, that sets us out and says, with this amount of dollars, these are the expected programs and f cost around that and the expected outcomes. But we can't, what we want to do, because things are going to change and we can't predict where the change is going to be, is to make sure that we maintain the continuity of where we are today but provide the flexibility to address evolving events. That's why it's so important to move to a, a, a group fund, but at the same time set the signal in the market that we expect the attention to be moving towards commercial implementations and that therefore the a burden on ratepayers, the surcharge burden, will be reduced. And, and we want to start, I would like to see this reduction begin in 2016. The amount of reduction, I don't want to prejudge Absolutely. because I want to see the budget come in. If they come in with a higher amount, we'll have to you know, look at it, but like any other thing, I'm telling the staff and NYSERDA, the burden is going to be on you to convince us that we need to increase the funding as opposed to reduce it. Absolutely. But clearly, we, you know, that's why we set this out. I believe it's important to set the expectation 
of where we'd like this to land. Absolutely. And I think also, really, I think what's necessary is, you know, when I look at this, is that what what's hard is there are all these different proceedings, and it's hard for me to keep track. And I know it's very hard even for staff to keep track. And, you know, people get confused, you know, even when they saw on the agenda that there's this clean energy fund, I had to go back through the orders to figure out which order had first mentioned the clean energy fund and um, then kind of figure out, well, where does it fit within all of this? And it is part of the REV proceeding, it's part of the EAPS proceeding, it's part of the RPS, New York Sun is part of RPS, it's part of Green Bank, and somehow we need to do a better job because we are trying to merge clean energy together and we need to do a better job of figuring out how everything fits so that people don't have to be figuring it all out and trying to follow everything because everybody's head is spinning and they want to be able to be you know you know uh, understanding it and we need to do a better job um, because you know we are um, you know the the um, uh, w working with ratepayer funds here, and we we need to be accountable to that. Um, looking at that, I think it's also important that we understand exactly what the metrics are that we're trying to achieve. Um, part of the, if this isn't going to be rolled out into 2016, um, we got to understand what are we doing with RPS and uh, EAPS. Um, is is there going to be an RPS solicitation? Are there going to be changes to RPS? Um, what is that? Um, I'd like to see um, in the proposal uh, in uh, August some mention from, you know, whether it's a store proposal or something from staff um, that is you know, giving some certainty uh, to the public on what's happening with that. Um, I think that there needs to be a signal so that people um, understand that we are serious about um, doing something. Do you have any further questions? Uh, let me look. I did have a lot of questions, but I think uh, your, some of your changes, um, will there be actual changes to um, the draft orders, that's what I'm hearing, is, is going to be... I, I think the draft order comp contemplates what we were talking about, is that, the, that there will be a proposal that comes in that addresses these issues. I, let me, um, let me uh, if I can, let me just take a minute and then I'll turn it over to the other commissioners for Actually, comments. I don't think so. I think that what you were proposing were some changes to the draft order because you were talking about some uh, changes in terms of the level of ratepayer. No, no, no. I, I think the draft order says that we want a budget-bounded approach, and <clears throat> ideally we want it to be less than the 2015. That's our expectation. Um, but that, obviously, we're not foreclosing something now because we don't have the record yet to determine what is the right level of funding going forward. It's directionally where, I, where the Commission is asking NYSERDA and, and staff to focus. So I'm going to reserve my right to ask more questions um, after okay. other commissioners talk. All right. If, if I can, I, I do want to move forward, do just take a few minutes and, and comment. So one is uh, I'm appreciative of the Clean Energy Fund pro pro proposal for this reason. I think that having separate funds has created any number of ang uh, problems in terms of how best to use ratepayer funding to have the most efficient result relative to clean energy, and this helps for provide that kind of fluidity. And, you know, as we've talked about even in the REV proceeding, we need nimbleness because we're in a point, inflex an inflection point, and looking at change. And so we need commission to give NYSERDA, just like we're asking the utilities, to rethink how things are done to this, so they're done more, more efficiently. So I, I'm appreciative of, of this concept to clean that up. I think in terms of, you know, recognizing that this is a transition and uh, one the, that the elements that the staff have pointed out that are critical to the transition are maintaining the continuity. So there's not market unnecessary market disruption, and I fully expect to see proposals from staff on, on changes, if necessary, to the main tier RPS. We're going to continue on as this goes. We're not going to let things stop 
and then go because we recognize that people have made investments in the markets and we want to continue to see the market develop. So I'd like to s that this is not an indication that where there's a full stop and then we'll get back to folks. We're, we, that, that's going to continue. I think that the other piece is it's the philosophy of moving forward around expanding energy efficiency but expanding it with with consumer with uh, market-based solutions and animating markets is baked into this concept of sending the right market signals where this is going from um, a ratepayer funded approach and how that's complementary to the activity in rev understanding within that context there is going to be complexity because change is hard and complex but you know I I think that we've got a really a lot of smart people and we'll figure we'll figure it out in such a way and I think staff is uh what we're trying to do is be very transparent on where this change is occurring how it's occurring so people can understand not only where we are today but where we're headed and why we're headed there and how these two types of proceedings will work together so I think it's it's a necessary point to make this change and start the process so that NYSERDA can start thinking about and we and this company and the staff can and then we can where does what happens after 2015 as we proceed with changes in rev uh, we develop the green bank we look at New York Sun and the other programs that we want to continue to fund so it getting started now having a budget sending these signals allows for us to then give the market the confidence and the understanding of where things are headed so that people can adjust their plans appropriately and, and as necessary. So that's that's how I see this is all leading together. There is obviously going to be bumps in the road, things that we're going to have to adjust as we proceed because that always happens when you're trying to transform from one type of approach to a second approach. But I think this I, this coming up with a budget this summer, which which is more comprehensive, is an essential piece of where we're headed with everything else. So I, I am so totally supportive of opening this proceeding, and I think it is very very necessary based on where we want to go with everything. It's, it is part of a whole, and I think we have to look at it that way. So with that, I'll open it up to any further comments. Commissioner Sarah? To be a good and responsible steward of all of these ratepayer funds, we obviously have to periodically reconsider and retarget the programs that the funds are supporting. The changes in the market that are already taking place due to technology and green bank and a host of other factors and that are likely to accelerate as part of our REV proceeding create an opportunity that can't be missed in order to ensure that the programs are well targeted as economically as are economically administered as possible and, and uh, consistent with the state's policy objectives. I really see this item as simply moving us to the next step in this process and on that basis I fully support it and I particularly look forward to, as, as the Chair does, to the reduction in ratepayer funding as competitive markets develop. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Akinbor. Uh, I'd like to agree with some of the comments that were made by the chair. In transition and building a bridge and instituting new change, things are never easy. Uh, but there again, my favorite word always gets put into the mix, and that's called flexibility. And uh, what we've instituted with the REV and now moving forward with this, I think does send the right signals to the investors uh, and the programs that we've already looked at uh, so that there is a future. People need to know what's going to go on in New York State and that this is a place for investment and that we do have a plan. And I think that this is kind of cohesive and brings everything together. So I, I do support this and I thank everybody for the hard work. And again, the flexibility. If something's wrong, we come back. We've been coming back for a long time. There's nothing wrong with that uh, because you can't get something as big as rev and changing all of this. You can't get it done at one time. It's never going to be right the first time or the second time, the third time, and maybe even more. So um, I look forward to moving on with this. Thank you. Yes. 
You know, I, maybe I'm being overly simplistic, but right now we've authorized programs through the end of 2015. It is May 2013. No matter what we're going to do, we needed to start a proceeding about what we're going to start doing in January 2016. We could have done it under the old pots and the old buckets and do a renewable portfolio standard proceeding and an energy efficiency portfolio standard proceeding. Instead, I think wisely we're trying to put them together and make a clean energy fund. I'm not predetermining anything here today. Whether I mean, we can have aspirational goals of reducing money in 2016. It may not make sense to reduce money in 2016. I want to see the evidence. All we're doing today, from my perspective, is start the process of the 2016 review with an open mind, with the evidence coming our way, and we'll go from there. And we know that there's other things going around since we just implemented a REV proceeding that it would be silly for us to go forward with this proceeding without taking that into account. So that's what I see we're approving today and not much beyond that, except just clarifying where it sits in the pantheon of proceedings we have going on. Well, yes, well said, and I think simple is best. There was, the, was it the KISS theory of regulation? Um, but I, I do think that, that the other thing we are doing this proceeding is trying some clarification because there have been activities that we initiated, which in light of the initiation of the REV proceeding, we felt were going to be duplicative. So it was important to get some clarification so people understood where things would land. And, I again, I appreciate everyone's tolerance that just like we're asking the we can't ask the industry to change and then sit and still and continue to do everything we do the same way. So um, any other – did you have any yeah, questions, I'm Commissioner? I'm glad Ryan? I saved yeah. my uh, – reserved my comments. Uh, so I, you're, you're all not wrong, um, but I'm not wrong either. Um, so I think that there is uh, – you're right. We are um, starting or commencing something, but we need to also be able to review what we have done and look – and we all have, there have been orders that have talked about the need to do a comprehensive review. Um, part of what's also out there are current pending proceedings, RPS being one of them, which is looking at, and EAPS, looking at what are some of the tweaks that we can make in the current RPS, in the current EAPS, um, what needs to be added. Um, so that is currently what we are trying to do is figure out um, what's appropriate. So part of this is when I looked uh, again at the draft um, uh, order for the Clean Energy Fund, it doesn't talk about new metrics. Um, it doesn't talk about um, folding in, uh, you know, the old metrics or, uh, you know, folding in uh, things um, or what's going to happen with the 2014-2015 um, um, processes. So we need to also make sure that um, we are, when, just because we're going to put it into a comprehensive clean energy fund, that we are looking at what are we going to do uh, new or different or better um, and make sure that we are not just putting it into one big pot just for the sake of that. I know that that's not the intent, um, but I think that we need to um, really ensure that we're also not doing anything um, that's harmful. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, some of the questions that I still have is, um, does this also include NIPA customers? Or LIPA, PSC, and G customers? Would they be able to participate? The, the proposal is not yet formed. Okay. So We're starting a proceeding to consider those kinds okay, of questions. And again, as I said from the beginning, you may not have the answers to that, but those are the, some of the things I would want to know. Um, will the criteria change? Again, those are some of the things for how will, will it be RPS and EAPS? How will that be determined in terms of with this clean energy fund? Will we be looking at one big criteria, or will it be different, different criteria? Depending All questions on it? to be considered as part of the proceeding, um, I believe. In the EAPS order, there were several things in the E2 working group that, for the action plan, um, there was something, and, and I'm blanking on the specific terminology, but it talked about MI and the business council and some of their concerns 
on the self-banking fund um, and it said some of those ideas were really good ideas and they should work with um, or submit proposals to the E2 working group and the E2 working group should um, talk to them. How are those types of things going to happen um, with the entities? But if I can, let me suggest this. I think that there's there's two things that we we need to do, and I don't want to. I'm not cutting short your questions, but there's two elements to to keep in mind. One is is that the development of the clean energy fund will have to be justified both into the amount and how the funds will be used and administered and the metrics so that the commission can continue to re maintain its accountability for assuring that ratepayer funds are being used in the best appropriate way. That, that I think, is it's important that we give staff and NYSERD an opportunity to come back and develop out a proposal which will receive comments from the third parties so that when we make this decision, it's on a full record. I don't want to suggest that staff hasn't, should have answers before they develop the proceeding because that, that is really what the proceeding is about to right, make certain we're on, on the right track. Secondarily, I want to be clear that in our um, move towards this clean energy fund and simultaneously our move towards REV, there are some issues such as both in the REV docket and, frankly, even in the ESCO proceeding that are going to be, and in the EAPS proceeding, that really fold into the REV proceeding. And in the interest of comedy and efficiency of time, I, we, we've asked staff to begin identifying what types of issues really need to be put under this umbrella of a REV proceeding so that we don't have um, competing collaboratives and competing proceedings. I don't necessarily want to collect... Um, actually combine the proceedings into one docket because there are issues that may fall outside of it. But there are things such as issues raised about how mul the multiple interveners, how we l can make this better for industrial customers, really can be part and parcel of a REV-type consideration of public-private partnership or utility industry partnership. And so I don't want to preclude the how these issues will be evolved, but we are in this transition. I think for Commissioner Berman, for your assurances, what we can do, and I, I don't think we should do it today, but we can do it for you and all the Commission, is take a list of all the topic matters, EAPS, ESCO, and I know the staff is already working on this, and come up with a matrix that shows where these issues are going to be dealt with in which docket. So we have an assurance and then also provide that as so it's transparent to the parties so the parties understand where these issues are going to land because it is, we are in transition, we've opened up a new docket and that new docket to a certain extent has overtaken other proceedings where we were looking at these issues. So if you could, if I could ask your forbearance and give us an opportunity to develop that because it's already underway, I think that would clarify a lot of your, your concerns. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The, the question I have really is related to the order, though, the EAPS order, which actually I'm talking about the specific clarification that we're changing now um, in here, which deals with the uh, MI and the Business Council that, was direct, that we directed in the order um, that talks about them working with the E2 working group on their self-directed, the self-banked fund. Um, and I'm just trying to look. There were certain things, and I think there were about four or five things in the EAPS order that said, talk, work with the E2 working group. And the one that comes to mind off the top of my head was the uh, MI and Business Council working with the E2 Working Group. Another one that comes to mind is the um, privacy concerns of, um, you know, customer privacy concerns. So what I wanted to just make sure is that those things that are in there, that they don't fall off the table because we're now changing the actual specific order and how are those things getting changed because we're clarifying certain portions of it, but we're not clarifying it legally in this order. Uh, Council, I, I think the order addresses all the, the separate tasks that were uh, raised in the EAPS order, um, specifically the MI uh, issue. Uh, it, the order does, or the draft order does suggest um, that 
those issues are probably best considered as part of the rev proceeding because it seems more co like a, a deeper, more comprehensive change um, than some of the other issues. But I believe if you go through the list of the EAPS order that all of them are addressed in the current order. Okay. Are they suggesting um, they should be where they should be considered? There's okay. The, the order does not wipe anything off the table. Um, okay. It, it tries to recognize as much as we can from this standpoint the best way to address it. Okay, them. perfect. Thank you. Okay. Are we ready to take a vote? Okay, so we have two votes for 201 and two A and B. And just before we start to make it easier, I'm going to um, vote I, but concurring based on my discussions here. Okay. Um, so for 201A, all those in favor of the recommendation to adopt a resolution and issue a positive declaration in support of the uh, CICRA, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Hearing no opposition and with the clarification provided by Commissioner Berman, um, the recommendation is adopted. Then for the vote taken for 201B, all of those in favor of the recommendation to commence a proceeding to consider the development of a clean energy fund, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And again with the clarification. Okay, with the clarification, there being no opposition, the recommendation is adopted. Um, thank you, uh, Colleen and Tony and Deborah. That was, uh, I know these things can be somewhat complicated, but great job. And council. Okay. Now that it's hot in here, let's talk about the summer. So, just kidding, just kidding. So we're going to be moving to item 301, which is a uh, staff report, actually, on the, our 2014 summer preparedness. Ms. Barney, are you leading the discussion? Yes, I am. Uh, good morning, Chair Zibelman, Commissioners. I will be presenting on the summer preparedness of the bulk electric system. Next slide. Oh. First slide. First slide. <laughs> Let me proceed just with the overview. I plan to go through how the system is planned to have resources available to serve load and then talk about the operating environment in which available resources are used to actually serve the load. So we will start with what the load levels are expected to be, what resources are available to serve the load, and the readiness of the New York ISO and transmission owners to manage the system this summer. No slide? Okay. Uh. Okay. Raj is trying to pretend he's Tammy, but she's not going <laughs> to let him. They didn't, they didn't buy it, Raj. <laughs> nice try. Okay. Okay, back up. Oh, one more. Forward one. <laughs> yeah. It's Raj's fault. We need As slide always. three. <laughs> there you go. This graph presents the forecast of peak demand for New York this summer, along with a five-year history to provide some context. The blue line is the actual recorded load levels, and the red line converts the load levels to a weather-normalized basis. This summer's forecasted peak load of 33,666 megawatts is consistent with the historical trend. The load forecast is based on a 50-50 forecast for most of the state, with the exception of Consolidated Edison and Orange and Rockland, which use a 70-30 forecast. A 50-50 forecast means there is an equal chance of the load being higher or lower than the forecast. So Con Edison and O&R are being more conservative by using a 70-30 forecast. Next. New York City is always a special concern, and here is the same graph as presented for the statewide demand for the city. 
The peak load is anticipated in the city to be 11,783 megawatts, which again is consistent with the historical trend. Next slide. What are the resources available to serve the anticipated load of 33,666 megawatts? In-state generating capacity is anticipated to be 37,978 megawatts. Additionally, there are demand, resource, demand response resources, which include special case resources of 1,189 megawatts and 94 megawatts are signed up for the Emergency Demand Response Program. Capacity-backed imports amount to 2,130 megawatts. For a total of 41,298 megawatts of resource capability available for the summer, or about 123% of expected peak load. Next slide. How do the resources available stack up to what is required to maintain a reliable system? Annually, the PSC looks to the New York State Reliability Council to determine what installed reserve margin is required to help ensure load can be met reliably. The amount calculated by the Reliability Council and adopted by the Commission for this year is 17 percent. This so slide reflects that for the base load forecast, available resources exceed the IRM for a forecasted supply surplus of about 1,900 megawatts. That said, it should be noted that we are facing a dwindling of supply in the form of increased levels of generation retirement and reduced participation in demand resource programs. As we move resource levels closer and closer to the required reserve margin, which is currently 17 percent, it is important that replacement resources are correctly located and that the infrastructure is robust enough to move the energy around the state to serve the load. Next slide. The theory is that planning provides sufficient resources to meet expected load conditions, that planning the system to be able to endure the worst set of outages under peak loading conditions will provide operators with sufficient operating flexibility to serve most loading conditions. The information provided on the previous slides are predominantly based on a 50-50 forecast. What if we experience extreme weather consistent with a 90-10 forecast? Under that circumstance, the surplus disappears, and rather than meeting a 17% reserve margin, we will be down to 15%. While there is only a 10% chance of a high load condition at that level, there are enough resources to cover that load level. However, Murphy's Law says that high load conditions can happen when more than anticipated generation is out of service. Last summer proved to be a tight situation, and that tight situation could arise again this year. So what tools do the operators have to ensure reliability under extreme conditions? This slide presents, in descending order, the emergency operating procedures the New York ISO has available to it. First is to call on the EDRP resources, who have already volunteered to be curtailed. Second is to move to a voltage reduction, which will provide a quick reduction in load levels. Next, calls are made for voluntary industrial curtailment, which is followed by public appeals. Emergency purchases are the next resort. Generally, not everyone peaks at the same time, and there are usually resources available from our neighbors. Last is to eliminate 30-minute reserves which will still leave enough reserves to cover the largest contingency. Next slide. On the individual transmission owner basis, each transmission owner is reporting that they anticipate being able to meet peak projected loads in all areas under normal operating conditions. The companies have spare transformers, breakers, and equipment to rapidly repair most system failures. Consolidated Edison, in particular, has many of its own demand response programs that can provide relief and help shape the load under stress system conditions, which Tammy will be elaborating on in her presentation. This concludes the summary of the bulk electric system summer preparedness. Thank you, Diane. Um, Tammy, why don't we just move on to you? Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. 
Item 301B provides a summary of the New York State Utilities Preparedness on the Electric Distribution System for the 2014 summer season. Next slide. The Summer Preparedness Program requires that all New York utilities review their electric distribution system capability to withstand increased loadings during the summer period. Overall, the annual summer preparation process performed by each utility is very similar in methodology. The utilities each project summer load by reviewing historical summer loading information, taking into account historical weather conditions, load growth, and any new business information available to obtain projected loadings for the next summer season. The utilities then simulate its electric system using the projected summer loadings to identify any equipment or specific areas where overloading may occur. From these efforts, projects are selected for completion prior to the next summer season. In terms of our review and monitoring of these efforts, staff requests that the utilities provide reports starting in March of each year. These reports include a summary of the company's process, procedures, and associated efforts, along with a list of equipment, such as transformers and circuits, that are at or above normal operating ratings during projected peak loading conditions, and a list of proposed projects identified for completion prior to June 1st. Typically, these projects include load transfers, capacitor bank installations, transformer upgrades, and sometimes new substations. Additionally, utilities provide status reports to staff on those projects identified for completion prior to the summer. This year, staff tracked a total of 189 projects identified by the utilities. At this time, the New York State utilities have completed approximately half of their identified projects. The remaining projects are considered minor and are still expected to be completed on or before June 1st. For any projects that are not completed before June 1st, the companies will develop and provide contingency plans describing alternatives to address potential problems. One quick note on staff's review. This year's staff's review and analysis included PSEG Long Island, um, summer preparedness efforts, which uh, prior to this they had not. Next slide. Due to its unique characteristics, Con Edison has in place multiple load relief programs available for deployment during high load conditions to alleviate potential feeder overloads. Two of its programs, its Direct Load Control Program, or Rider L, and its Distribution Load Relief Program, or Rider U, are implemented by the company during system emergencies. Rider L allows Con Edison to reduce enrolled customers' demand by taking control of and cycling central air conditioning loads. The total amount of load reduction available through Rider L program is approximately 37 megawatts for both small commercial and residential customers enrolled at this time. Under Rider U, participants provide demand response through load reductions or operation of on-site generation when called upon by Con Edison on a network-by-network -network basis. The total amount of load reduction available through Rider U program at this time is approximately 182 megawatts. A third program, Con Edison's Commercial System Relief Program, or Rider S, is a more proactive program whereby customers are called upon to curtail based on day-ahead load forecasts. This program is available to any customer that can, can curtail load or offset load with on-site generation by a minimum of 50 kW for an individual customer or to aggregators that can offer 100 kW of load reduction. Participants receive financial incentives to reduce load during events which are called by the company when the day ahead forecasted load is at least 96% of the company's forecasted system-wide peak. At this time, the Rider S program has approximately 100 megawatts, <laughs> yes, megawatts of load reduction signed up at this time. I'm going back and forth between the little increments and the bigger increments. I'm used to all the big stuff that Diane has now. <laughs> Enrollment in all three of Con Edison's demand response program is up this year and is expected to increase as a result of May and June continuous enrollment periods. In conclusion, based on our analysis, staff is satisfied that utilities distribution systems are prepared to meet the needs of the upcoming 2014 summer period. This concludes my presentation. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have no questions. I think this is a... Uh, a good presentation. Obviously, uh, you've covered the waterfront. 
in terms of moving forward, I appreciate uh, Diane and your comment that while things are, are certainly – the resources are adequate this summer and we're well within uh, our reserve requirement, that situation is tightening and it's certainly something we need to, to watch. I'm also aware that we're anticipating higher prices this summer, which of course is, is always moving into a summer a matter of concern. But um, I, I think that uh, we're going to be meeting again next week uh, to talk about the uh, polar vortex, what happened this past winter, and its implications on infrastructure requirements, resource requirements in the state. And I think uh, while, you know, we are we're, – the initiation of this proceeding was this past winter prices, and we'll be looking at the causes and what happened and what we should be doing – it doesn't, you know, this is, is all one and the same. Ultimately, if we need resources in the winter, we definitely need resources for the summer. And um, appreciate staff's diligence on that. And I think this is clearly a uh, watch this spot. There's there's more to come and more more information. Thank you. Any further, any questions or comments? Um, we have one more on the price. On the prices. Oh, there you go. Sorry, I was foreshadowing in an artistic way. Go ahead, Mr. Twergram. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Raj. Good morning, Chair Zibelman and Commissioners. Regarding item 301C, I'll be providing you with a summary of how the utilities have performed at reducing their electric supply price volatility for their full-service residential customers. Go over the utilities' residential electric su uh, supply portfolio for this summer and finally, compare this summer's forecast electric market prices to last summer's actual prices. But first, I'll provide a brief summary of the Commission's supply portfolio guidelines. Next slide. There have been three Commission orders that have addressed retail supply price volatility mitigation. The first is the Commission's retail market policy statement issued in 2004. The policy statement identified as a long-term goal that competitive suppliers should eventually displace the utilities in performing the supply function. In the near term, however, utilities are to maintain supply portfolios to protect resident, residential and small commercial and industrial customers, collectively mass market customers, against wide swings in spot market prices. The Commission also determined that large commercial and industrial customers are to be exposed to hourly spot market pricing and that no new hedges are to be entered into by the utilities for these customers. Slide. The second order issued in 2007 laid out the Commission's supply portfolio guidelines. The guidelines reinforced that utilities should engage in hedging to reduce the supply price volatility for their mass market customers, that portfolios should encompass a variety of hedging instruments and also include some wholesale purchases, and that utilities are to avoid entering into contracts that are unduly risky due to their length or other unfavorable characteristics. Slide. The third order issued in 2008 addressed utility reporting requirements. The order requires utilities to report quarterly on their portfolio volatility mitigation results using the coefficient of variation. Each quarter, utilities file electric market and their supply portfolio prices for the previous 12 months and the resulting coefficients of variation as a means to evaluate the effectiveness of their portfolios. In this order, the Commission also determined that setting strict standards for volatility mitigation was not appropriate. Slide. This graph shows the results of the utilities' electric supply price volatility mitigation efforts. It compares the average New York ISO market price volatility, the red uh, line, to the volatility of the utility's residential electric supply portfolios. As we all know and can see from the graph, electric market prices increased dramatically this past winter. Issues surrounding this past winter supply prices will be the focus of next week's technical conference. While improvement opportunities exist, and modifications to the utility hedging practices and or supply rate mechanisms are being formulated. As a result of the Commission's hedging policies, the utility's residential supply portfolios have been significant, significantly less volatile than the market. 
So what, ha so what is the Commission's hedging policies that perform this level of supply, uh, supply price volatility mitigation, cost rate payers in terms of gains and losses relative to market prices? Slide. Essentially nothing. This slide shows the annual above or below market cost of the utilities hedges that were executed pursuant to the Commission's hedging policy. The bars represent annual gains, uh, hedging gains or losses. The line represents the cumulative gain or loss since 2005. Negative numbers mean that the contracts were priced below market. On a cumulative basis over the past nine years, ratepayers have essentially paid no premium for the supply price volatility reduction. Slide. This chart shows the elements of the composite residential electric supply portfolio for this summer. As shown, about half of the composite portfolio consists of fixed-priced instruments. Of the fixed-priced instruments, the majority are financial contracts and also include newer physical contracts, older legacy contracts, and a small amount of the utility's own generation with fixed fuel costs and NIPA contracts. The balance of the portfolio is predominantly made up of market purchases, followed by relatively small amounts of the utility's own generation with variable fuel costs, index contracts, index to gas primarily, and options contracts. Slide. This chart shows this summer's expected average energy market prices based on NYMEX futures for New York City, the Hudson Valley, and Western New York, New York ISO zones J, G, and A, respectively. Last summer's expected energy market prices that we reported to the Commission last May are in green. Last summer's actual market prices are in blue. This summer's expected average market prices are in red. As shown, this summer's energy market prices are expected to be higher than last summer's prices, mainly due to projected increase in gas prices compared to last summer. Projected increases range from 23 to 25 percent compared to last summer's prices, depending on zone. But please note that these are only projections. In the past five years, actual prices were below forecasts for two years, above forecasts for two years, and about equal to the forecast at a year. Slide. This graph is primarily showing the same data as the prior one, uh, just with the winter period uh, inserted in the middle, just uh, for perspective. One uh, interesting point to note here, when this graph was uh, created, actual April prices were not available. Uh, they have uh, since become available, and they were 13 to 17 percent less than the forecasts, uh, again, depending on zone. Slide. This slide compares this summer's New York ISO six-month summer strip auction capacity prices to last summer's prices. In addition to the projected energy market price increase compared to last summer, capacity prices will also be higher this summer, especially for customers located in the new Lower Hudson Valley capacity zone. Based on current projections from the NYMEX data and capacity price data obtained from the New York ISO, this summer's electricity prices are expected to be higher than last summer's actual prices. Again, though actual prices can vary from forecast due to a number of factors such as weather and economic conditions. With the hedges the utilities have entered into, mass market customers will not experience the full magnitude of any market price changes. And that concludes my presentation. First of all, thank you. I apologize. Even though uh, Commissioner Brown is the more senior member, I seem to have had a senior moment. So, uh, but let me, Mike, could you, can you go back to just real quick to your volatility slide? Just so I, I think this is a, an important element is that what we're seeing is if I get this right, is is that while the um, volatility can change relative, I mean, obviously, period in the spot market, the effectiveness of the hedges would indicate that the volatility that consumers are seeing is substantially less than the than full market exposure. For most of the period, it was uh, half of the right the. the uh, 
portfolio volatility was about half of the uh, market volatility, and certainly uh, at the last few points from this winter, it was uh, significantly less volatile than the market. And then, then if you go to the next slide, it, it certainly indicates that the, um, in terms of the mark to market, that over time there are periods of time where you you know if you had perfect knowledge, which we none of us have, you would say, oh, we overhedge. Other times you would say we underhedge, but over time. It it all works out that basically you're at, at zero that it, that the price of the hedges put you where you want to be. Is that that's what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Just one follow up so question. Let me, just, um, yeah. let me just amplify on the previous slide. What that showed was more of how the supply portfolio behaved, as to how it shows up in end use customer bills. Is there's one more step okay. of how the rate making gets done in terms of forecasting price and then reconciling the changes from actual to the forecast, that may introduce a little bit more volatility than what you see here. Thank you. That's My question was, does this include utility provider of last resort customers, or is this across the board including all ESCO customers? No, this is, uh, this is only full-service customers. That's what I thought. Utility customers, utility not the ESCO customers. We'll follow up on that next week. Right, right. Mass market customers. So, but but the point is, is that, and, I, and that's what I was going to say, is is that even though we're seeing these the hedges being effective relative to what we would hope to achieve, the absolute prices and the volatility we saw this summer, this winter, was very high in terms of an individual bill basis, and and so what what we'll want to understand, I would think, out of coming out of this, understanding these types of price volatility in the market looking at our hedging strategies going forward to see what more we can do because to avoid this type of mass market exposure to this price volatility and price increases because it ultimately telling someone well over the last 10 years it's been okay doesn't really cut it when you're you're paying a bill that's 200% higher than the bill you normally pay and the other question i'd be interested in is what sort of hedging products are available That's to correct. customers. So, so not today. Don't need to answer it. But again, I think I think this is a really good um, precursor to I, what I hope will be a much deeper conversation as we begin to go to next week to really start thinking about with these type of a weather events like we had past winter, this past winter, and with uh, changes in the supply mix, what does this mean for us in a, in a forward-looking process? Commissioner Do we look at surrounding states so that we have an idea of where the other states around us are? Yeah, um, different states have different uh, restructured markets. Um, probably outside of Texas, perhaps, we are the most retail market state with almost half the load being served by competitors. And in terms of procurement policies, different states have different approaches. Um, some have a lot more heavy state um, commission uh, determined uh, hedge policies, uh, more active engagement by the commission. Here, uh, this commission has provided guidance to the utilities and allowed flexibility to to rearrange the portfolios and, and make judgments. Um, that said, I think our programs have been reasonably successful, as you saw in the redu reduction in volatility based on the commission guidelines, and the, and the utilities have been working with staff along the way. Um, and But we'll hear next week uh, what changes the utilities are planning to make based on the lessons learned over the last winter. And also in the bulk presentation, Diane, um, you've been here for a long time. Um, could you just give us like a snapshot of the past few years, how this year's projections versus the past two or three years? From load perspective, um, it's been a moderate increase. Um, no real major spikes, especially when you get to weather normalized. Um, those forecasts seem to be pretty good. Uh, the concerns are more on the supply mm -hmm. level. Um, Ten years ago, we weren't at this 23% level. We were at a 40% surplus level. So there was a lot of flexibility in, to, in the system. Um, there was a much larger dispersal of small generation. Um, 
which has been diminished through retirements, um, which the net result is there is a lot more pressure put on the transmission system mm -hmm. because of that. Uh, and concern about the retirements are do we have the generation in the right place so that we can move the energy to the load centers when we need to. So e things are getting tighter on the system. There is no doubt about it. Let me just add, um, as you've probably seen in the last few years, the energy prices have dropped significantly, notwithstanding this last winter. Over the last number of years, gas prices have dropped, and that resulted in lower energy margins to many of the generators, and that has resulted in either mothballing or retirement. Over the last few years, significant amount of mothballing or retirements have happened. And so the supply is getting tighter and tighter as we move forward. Uh, the capacity prices have also dropped in the past. That also contributed to the mothballing. But they are bouncing back up a little bit. We'll see how, what that means to uh, the generator profitability. But the situation is tightening, as the chair had yeah, mentioned. Yeah, I just too. wanted to do a little walk down memory lane. Yeah. Thanks. And it, it's uh, just, so we've said it, it's not a phenomenon that's unique to New York, which is another issue, is that we're seeing retirements elsewhere, which also then affects your import capability. That's an observation, not a need for a comment. Any further questions? Okay, well, thank you, and uh, we'll look forward to further discussion next week on May 15th on this topic. Uh, with that, Secretary Burgess, is there anything more in front of us today? There is nothing more for today for the Commission to consider. And as you mentioned, the next Commission meeting is next Thursday, May 15th. It will be the Technical Conference on Winter, winter Energy Pricing and Supply, and that will begin at 9 a.m. Thank you, and we stand adjourned. <laughs>